So I will keep the tradition that I would like to thank Helen and Yanis for this organization. And I try to keep my voice up. <coughs> um, my academic research related with this subject is actually my uh, ethnographic observation. I'm from Famagusta. I live in Famagusta. I work in Famagusta. I swim in Famagusta, mm -hmm. so I completely know the land and the landscape as well as underwater very well. I was licensed swimmer, winner of 50 and 100 meters, and a long runner, long uh, marathon swimmer. So therefore, I am experienced uh, Famagusta very well from underwater and then the cultural level as well. So I'm going to deliver my observations and my ethnographic uh, experience as well as with some historical perspective. Uh, for this project, particularly for this project, I think I am very much involved with Iliada and Nurtana. So what they actually delivered, I don't want, I don't want to repeat because I also interview uh, the fishermen as well. So because of that, some part I'm going to cut to make it short and not to have the reputation. So in case if there's any missing information, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, so as a proud from Augustian, from Augusta is very nice, very uh, cool looking medieval, medieval uh, wall that city is actually developed from the there. So first of all, this, uh, this, is, this was the harbor. And as you see that there wasn't any um, big construction next to the wall. So just small uh, uh, facets that the, the ships can come closer and then do the shipping, whatever that they were doing. So during that time, especially I'm talking about a little bit much more closer times, such as um, beginning of 19th, maybe 1940s, this medieval wall had a little, little gate, but it wasn't like a man-made, but it's like a, a destruction of the wall, that the people who were living in the city, they were using that little gate to access for the swimming in that area, especially for the Islamic community. Um, they were using this part of the wall, as you see the round, to go as the female, and the other part is the male. So they were not going in the same part. So because of that, they were giving two names. One side they were calling the blue sea, and the other one was the green sea. And the little access on the wall was called the hole. So that's my another research subject which is going on. So as you see that in the meantime, city grow and these medieval walls actually turn to this construction. And the port built it in this area. Uh, this, of course, changed the lifestyle of the Famagustian because everyone who was having a direct access to the sea, the direct access actually is totally finished and closed. So because of that, uh, while developing this construction, Warosha on the other side, on the back of that, was raising very much. And Warusha actually became one of the most popular uh, tourist uh, resort in, the, in Cyprus, in, in Cyprus and generally in the region. So um, Warusha was the one that, who was making like 70% of economy. And because of that, they were attracting too much uh, tourists and sudden, sudden growth of Barosha become between like 58 to 74. And especially in mid of 64 till uh, 74, many big constructions start raising up next to the sea. So as you see that how the wall is just covered with the port, you can see the same development with the big constructions, big apartments, big flats, big tourist resort raising up parallel to the coastal side, actually on the beach. So this becomes such a model for generally for Cyprus. So this model is actually what you were saying, uh, showing with the blue uh, map, is happened before in Varosha. And this is actually the model for the other cities because it's a reference. 
first reference of how wrongly constructed our coastal sites. So it becomes maybe the best resource for the tourists, but on the other hand, for the people who are living in that area, still having very difficulties to access to the beach because uh, the resorts are keeping the beach for themselves. So it says that the beach side belongs to the public. However, then if you go there, sometimes you get some trouble. So because of that, daily practice is getting very difficult in some areas. In the north, there are lots of um, activists against for this. And they are actually coming together, going some particular beach to break this, you know, the um, statico. And in, in Varosha, while Varosha growing, while Varosha growing, and while this area becoming very touristic and very popular, um, this was a very big discussion where to build the Famagusta port. To build it in here or build it in there. So it's like the same region, totally, as you see, that very beautiful beach uh, continues over the Famagusta coast. And Turkish Cypriot community wanted to have the port close to the old city because all the non-Islamic ones were living in the old city. So they could able to economically get benefits out of that. They didn't want to give all the economical uh, incomes, sources to manage by the Greek Cypriots. So because of that, Famagusta port built it in that area. So you see that, you know, in meanwhile, lots of uh, um, port function as a transporting for the food, but as well as that because of the colonial uh, connections, it was also the military port for the British. So then British was transferring lots of goodies, lots of supplements, lots of military equipment to the Africa through the Cyprus, and especially from the Famagusta. And in meanwhile, the uh, Varosha and Varoshian, of course, having a big habitation all over the coastal. Um, and suddenly, of course, in 74, it, the division happened. And then this beautiful place turned to the no man's land. And nobody could able to access, nobody could able to go in. Just you become uh, the observer of a ghost city. And you don't know actually what is going on. And that's exactly where we came and we start with the city. So we never been in Varosha. We, I never experienced Varosha until they opened Varosha for the partial visit for the, uh, everyone. So because of that, Varosha was a forbidden city for us that we could not able to go, not able to take picture, not able to talk about it. And suddenly it becomes accessible. So when we access to the city, of course, from this to that, it was very different, very, very different. But we were not experienced this before. We were always experienced that one. So we were familiar with this, but not that one. And we were very much familiar with this kind of scenes because this is what we were seeing as a Varusha. Varusha for us was abandoned, although vegetations take over of the city, which I saw it in Cambodia, I couldn't believe. I thought that it's only happened in Cambodia. So I thought that Angkor Wat was something mythical place that really you can see that uh, the, the vegetation take over the city. No, it happens in 40, 50 years just next to us. And of course, because we needed to ignore and not to see it, we couldn't understand what is going on. So then you start daily visiting Varosha because you want to know about it, what is going on. So every day you go in and look to the other street, look to the other houses, look what is going on. So you see that some vegetations are actually never died, even that they they still blossom and you can still smell the jasmines. It's really amazing and unbelievable. 
But another thing, when they start you know, digging and opening some street, it's unbelievable that this bug came out all over the Famagusta, and we couldn't understand what is it. As a cockroach phobic person, to seeing a transparent cockroach walking around the city in the daytime, it was so scary. So we already had one brown one. So what is this transparent one? was always very much scared. So I tried to find out what is that. And uh, there are lots of um, groups on social media. So I start you know, asking the, the to ID or find it out. So actually, I find it out that it's, uh, as you see, that it's a type of uh, type of cockroach, I prefer to say it, it's difficult to say its Latin name. Uh, and it's, it's actually a scent cockroach. And because they start digging the Varosha to open the roads, inhabitations of 40 years start coming out and invading the other side of the city. So, of course, daily, daily routine that you go and see, you observe the plants, you observe the, the destruction, you observe the occupation, you observe the, uh, the plants are taking over. And of course, for us, as I said, that it's maybe you can call it authentic and very sad. And of course, it makes you very angry. But on the other hand, what also I observed that I am not the only one who is going there. The, the former residences are going there daily. And they wanted to see their houses. They wanted to reach their life. They wanted to access to somewhere. And for me to have a plant, beautiful, smells nice, it wasn't like that anymore. Because then I met with Yanis, who was sitting under this jasmine and telling me that when I was eight, we were running and coming and sitting under this jasmine. And it was smelling so nice, and it was only shadow here. So now it's a huge. So then every corner of the space gain an identity. And it's not an abandoned space anymore. It becomes from the ghost to a person, identity, life, lifestyle. Because every time when I start going to the beach and taking a seat in here, I start thinking that this is Anna's house, this is Helen's house, this is Andrew's house, and every day that uh, Yorgos was swimming to the camel. So we didn't even know that the little rocks in there are called camel. For us, it was the rocks. After meeting with lots of Varusia, city and spaces start getting names and identities. So I know what does it mean to swim to camel. So I start swimming with them. And I start going to the camel as well. So then I start having different experience, which I am a very good swimmer. I swim kilometers there, but I never swim to camel before. So after all this experience, and uh, I start walking daily with Varosians in the city, and then learning more and more. They, sometimes I met with them, sometimes I just follow them like a stalker, just talk with them, listen to them, observe them, because it was so uh, touchy for me that this abandonance actually is not any more abandonance for me. So I wanted to know more. As much as that I know about the city and the spaces, I feel more connected. I was going there to swim with turtles, but I couldn't go there anymore because I was not feeling belong to there. I needed to gain new identity, new experience to able to go there because I was feeling a little bit ashamed to not have. I wish that we were having it together. So that's changed my perspective about the city and the development in there. And one day we were walking with Paulos and Paulos actually was telling me that there was a little fisherman place. So this f little fisherman place, as you see now, abandoned and now totally demolished, was belonged to the municipality and the church. And all the fishermen were there going to the, that little fishery place. And they were actually uh, 
it's like a low budget place for the fishery and the fishermen places that they could able to afford. However, because of all this touristic development, they couldn't keep the place. They wanted to turn it to these big hotels. So then little church and the little uh, f fisher locals is destroyed. Fantastic buildings done. And the new church built it just behind that, which the local of the Varoshan called it disco church. They never feel they belong, and they start calling it as a disco church because it was for them a fantastic place, but not a church. So because of that, as making fun, they start calling it disco. Another one that uh, I observed, when they opened the access to the Warosha, first I wanted to see that, okay, I come daily to swim in Warosha, I swim with sometimes one turtle, sometimes four turtles. And they should have some nest on this beach because 40, 50 years abandonment means that it gives an access for them, limitless access to make nest. So everyone goes to the building, I went to the beach. So I was searching where are the, you see these little holes are actually the turtles nest. So the full beach was full of nests. I was like, yes, here, bravo, very good. Of course, you see something said, it happens because in one nest you can have 200 maybe baby turtles and some of them before they leave, they, they die. So because of that, you observe this, unfortunately. But at least you know that there are others are living and they are actually came here because it was silent, nobody, dark. So you, you start thinking, what is development? What did we develop? What is our relationship with our habitation, with our nature and economy? Economy is changing actually our relation with because we want more tourists. So because of that, we occupy the beaches. So after a very short period, all these beautiful nest place covered with this. So if you go now, you don't see empty, you don't see the nest, you see only this one. And what are they protected? They protect the sand lilies. Sand lilies are protected in Varusha. So generally in, in Cyprus, they are protected pieces. So you can go and swing on them, but actually there is no space for the turtles anymore. Uh, actually, generally when we are looking for our relationship with the ecology, geology, spaces, and other spaces living in, around, uh, around the Mediterranean, you see that you can count maybe 15 different uh, species that in Mediterranean they are moving and it's not only located next to Cyprus, all the Mediterranean, so then you can see the activities, they move around and it's a very big ecosystem. And we think that we are just limited with, with what we have in here. So last year, maybe you also saw it in the news, we had like a very, very characteristic whales, like 12 of them crashed in Cyprus uh, coast. So they are whales actually. And we never heard about them before because they never come to the coast, but they are around the island. So because they made a, a military uh, training with some sounds under the water, all these species just suicide or become deaf and we found them at the beach. Or a previous year in Syria, there was an accident of the, the petrol leak in the water. I don't know, maybe some few of you remember it. So daily we were expecting when that leak going to hit Famagusta because it was, you see that coming to Famagusta. So when we think that we can protect the island by ourselves in here, 
we also need to think much more general because not only us. So when we think about we are an island, okay, internally we can protect it. But also we need to have some awareness about it. When we start researching, when we become uh, or involving with it, awareness takes very much importance. It's not only just you leave it, you also need to understand how to protect it. So again, that very, very much as we said that we have lots of invasive uh, marine species that we can observe, which is uh, one of them is the, the puffy fish. Uh, as Nurtana and Iliada mentioned that uh, marine biologists and the fishermen are very much mentioning about this kind of uh, the types and they are very much complain sometimes. However, the most famous uh, uh, fish type, sokan, sokani, is actually a migrant fish as well. But everyone is accepting it as a local fish. However, it was the one or the one of the first came from the, the um, Red Sea. So these ones are called as a predator. So because of that, they attack or they give danger to human. So human centered is much important. So because of that, they become very dangerous. And all the news that comes out related with them is like a warning. It's like a be careful. It's something very bad happening. And we don't actually give them a space because we don't know are they going to stay or are they going to leave. So because they are just passing, maybe in three years they will leave, maybe not make it home. So, um, so there are lots of regulations, lots of practices against this kind of species, such as government, uh, Republic of Cyprus, in some period was giving a, like one euro per each if they were catching one of these puffy fish. In, in 1940s, 1950s, they were giving it for the uh, wasp. So if, if anyone uh, brought a dead wasp to the ministry, they could be able to get a one, one Cyprus lira or something. So this kind of politics or this kind of regulations are not new. It's continuing, it happens and happening. And all the news that comes out, the new species are coming, like a warning or very, very dark. So everybody should be afraid about it. But actually, when I was a child, I remember this type of uh, the uh, shells were very much around. Or this one was, you know, you could be able to see. But because more they start uh, spotting them, they become a predator or something dangerous. And another one that in Famagusta recently, uh, in, in the winter period, some fish, which they call them shark, I prefer to say uh, fish, they saw some, maybe they were actually not shark, maybe they were dolphins, because in Cyprus the dolphins are having the fins, so you can very easily misspot them with a um, shark. And it's sensation like a shark came to Cyprus, Famagusta coast are full of sharks, something that, but actually we have very beautiful uh, two type of fish uh, the, the, there are seven, seven pieces, pieces of the, the, the turtles, but we have uh, two that you can spot very much. In my childhood, I, I remember that we were spotting karate karetas, big maybe than this table. Now, maybe barely you can see green turtles, they are this big or this big maximum. So, as much as that, you know, uh, the observation that you are experiencing daily is also changing. Another thing that I like to mention that as much as that if we are aware about our environment, if we know what is going on where, how is going, why, then you experience other things, such as that our trauma, one of our biggest traumas, missing people in Cyprus. And one of the missing people is actually found because before he become missing, he had a fig before he died. So where they buried him, 
after 20, 30 years ago, later, the fig actually growed. And that's how they found his body. And one of the anthropologists who knows the type of the fig could able to identify and report that there should be a missing person buried there. So we, if we know our island, if we know our ecology, if we know our ecosystem, we can do better. And we can do more peaceful life with others, we are more peaceful with each other. We don't destroy the, uh, the, the river bank by filling them with a, um, something, or we don't really actually burn the fields by, I don't know, going for a barbecue, or we don't build top on this uh, beautiful hotel and destroying the beautiful uh, little uh, spots for the Mediterranean seals. So that's need and awareness. And as much as the, you start researching, you become more activist, you become much more aggressive towards this kind of things, and you become very sensitive. So because of that, uh, living with others is actually making us to be aware how to respect to the others. Thank you.